at eight. Here they come, walking down the street. They get the funniest looks from everyone they meet. Hey, hey, meet the Royals, the number like you and me. A loaded with power and money, and chased by the Presenting Prince Harry of Wales, third in line to the throne of England, and perhaps soon to be one of Britain's most dashing military men. Run! You tell him, Harry. Run! Hey, hey, Davy Jones here. Don't be fooled by that spiffy uniform, because underneath beats the heart of a prankster. Welcome to Meet the Royals, where we take you inside the palace walls to see what it's really like to be a prince. The perks, the protocol, and the party animals. You see, Harry's the spare to the air. He's got no worries about becoming king. He can fulfill his role as a younger brother, do a little dance, make a little love, get down tonight. In short, the perfect heartthrob. Well, maybe he's a bit too tall, but he can't have everything. He's a hunk. Hunk, hunk. He just looks really, really good. He likes guns, he likes having fun, he, he likes destroying things. <laughs> I think military and wild child are good. And he does have a good line in banter, you know, would you like to come back to my palace for a drink? If I'd heard that Prince Harry has never experienced alcohol and never stayed out late and never chased any girls at all, I'd be very worried about him. But can this cheeky devil be both rebel and royal? Stick around as we discover the trouble with Harry here on Meet the Royals. Henry Albert Charles David, AKA Harry, is a 21st century teenager. He likes to hang out with the girls. He likes to party. He likes to smoke. He likes to drink. And why not? Harry is not the one. Harry is the also ran. So he has the perks and the privileges without the responsibility. And like a lot of teens, this royal raver, well, gets busted a lot. Prince Harry is at the heart of a drink and drugs controversy. Just that night. Prince Harry had drunk alcohol underage and smoked it's cannabis. And cannabis and underage drinking. But let's hit the royal rewind button to see how this all happened. First real awakening of any interest in Harry and his uh, problem with drink was uh, a year and a bit before we ran the actual story when he'd attended a party for one of the Duke of Westminster's children. By as early as midnight, he got as drunk as a skunk and uh, lost his bodyguard for an hour, which was quite a serious thing to happen. A number of newspapers knew about this and went to the palace about it, but it was explained as boyish high spirits, and we, we let it slide. But gradually, more and more things started to come unraveled. Rumor has it that underage Harry was trying the pub thing here at the Rattlebone Inn. Clearly new to the game, the prince got sick, not only in the bar, but on it. He was uh, underage, and he was not holding his drink terribly well. He was with friends, they were loud, they were um, fooling around. I suppose they can best be summed up as, as typical Hooray Henrys. British slang alert. A hooray Henry is a loud-mouthed upper-class fool. I'm sorry, Harry. Charles was gone a lot, leaving Harry on a home-alone trajectory. He'd go to the pub, he'd hang out, he'd invite people back to Highgrove. They'd set up a little nightclub in the basement of Highgrove, uh, which was really just a bit of fun for him and William, really, when they were younger. But it got more and more serious to start to have his own bar and his own hi-fi system and his own sound system. <laughs> Life is full of temptation if you're born a prince. Women, drugs, prestige, it's all there. Women will fall at your feet, men will bow and scrape. Yet while Prince Harry hit the headlines for his flirtation with booze and soft drugs, very few of the winters fall by the wayside. And when Prince Charles got into trouble as a teenager, it was for ordering cherry brandy in a Scottish pub. And that's just because he was underage. 
In fact, the royal family are a sober bunch. If they ever invite you around for dinner, be warned, a bottle of wine will last all night. The only exception to that rule was the Queen Mother. She always used to make sure that your champagne glass was filled. Harry and his chums kept their glasses full and partied in the basement hangout dubbed Club H until the wee hours of the morning. But when a royal staff member smelled dope and ratted, the party-hardy prince caught hell from his father. I think the Prince of Wales was aware and has been aware for a long time that Harry was potentially a problem. But the Prince of Wales is away an awful lot. And he's not, I don't think, the strictest disciplinarian. I think he rather shies away from that task and would rather just hope that things sorted themselves out. This time, however, Charles meant business till Prince William saved his brother's royal hide. And William actually really helped Harry here because he said, come on, Dad, you've got to be cool. There's no point being really angry. Just, you know, why don't we just send Harry to rehab for a day so he can really see what it's like when you're a drug addict? And it, it might shock him. Ducking the press, Harry toured Featherstone Lodge, a drug rehab center in London. The request was that we show him the kind of work that we do and that, that he gets to meet the people who, who were living here at the time. At Featherstone, Harry met heroin and crack addicts, sat in on group therapy, and took in the residents' artwork. It's not, not an easy thing to turn up to a drug rehab and start chatting with people. Prince Harry handled himself very well. He had a general demeanor of somebody who, who was interested in what was going on and wanted to know more. Back at Highgrove, the prince swore he'd never touch drugs again, apparently scared straight by his one-day visit. He promised that he would kind of get his head done and do some work, but Harry is not an intellectual. He doesn't want to work. He wants to party and have fun. After the visit, Harry asked Charles if they couldn't release a joint statement to the press. Joking aside, the press was still in the dark, but catching on fast. Though Harry's rehab visit remained secret, reporters staked out the rattlebone in hopes of glimpsing a royal binge. Reporters in the bar. That's never happened before. The press had kept Harry's exploits private for more than a year. But on January 13th, 2002, the tale of Harry's hijinks blew wide open. The rattlebone couldn't have paid for better PR. It was forced to hire bouncers to protect the regulars. There was journalists then taking photographs of everything, laptops everywhere, asking customers questions, um, stopping the staff coming through with food. Enough about the gaff, anyway. What about Harry? Suddenly, the blame shifted from Harry to his friends. The Queen supported Charles, and even the Prime Minister went to bat for the royal family. I think that the way that Prince Charles and the royal family have handled it is, is, is absolutely right, and they've done it in a very responsible and, as you would expect, uh, in a very sensitive way for their child. Others felt that the Prince of Wales had overreacted, that Harry's pot smoking came with the teenage territory. After it was announced that Harry had tried Spliff, uh, the reaction I got from uh, Clubbers was everyone thought that Harry was a normal person. And I think it was fantastic for him. Um, but as soon as uh, Harry took Spliff, he was just like any other normal person. But the truth is, Harry is not like any other person. He's a prince. I would hope the whole episode becoming so terribly public would have given Harry a short, sharp shock. He does have huge responsibility, and it is just not on, really, for members of the royal family to, to behave as, as he allegedly behaved. But it's difficult for Harry. I think he's, he's had a very difficult childhood. Question is, with a childhood like Harry's, what's to keep this wild child from growing into just one more playboy prince? And you deserve it. Prince Harry's full title is His Royal Highness Prince Henry Charles Albert David Windsor of Wales. Harry is the spare to the heir, third in line to the throne. Now, the royal line of succession has been worked out to hundreds and hundreds of places. It's always good to be prepared, after all. 
For instance, Baron Sebastian von Dinklage is number 244 on the list. Listen, I'm not making this up. The Baron is age three, by the way. Now, down at 576th place is King Juan Carlos of Spain. Now, chances are that he's not waiting by the phone for a call, you know. Uh, uh, King of England? Si, si. Gracias. <laughs> September 15, 1984, the public and Diana were thrilled to welcome the royal couple's second son, Prince Harry. Just about 9.30, Prince of Wales' press secretary came out with his piece of paper in his hand and he stood in the middle of the street with a cigarette on and he said, uh, his name is gonna be Prince Henry Charles Albert David and we're gonna know him as Harry. Charles was less excited. Prince Charles did actually want a daughter, and he was adamant that he only wanted two children. This is one of his things, and there's too many children in the world, too much starvation. And Diana's mother, Mrs. Shan Kidd, was really annoyed. I said, how can you possibly say that? You have a beautiful, healthy baby. Baby Harry was barely on the planet when Charles headed for the polo grounds. When Harry was born, Prince Charles had a polo match organized, and I think people were rather shocked. I mean, Charles would have had his polo matches fixed months and months in advance. Diana said herself, I think I, I, I've been induced between two polo matches. For Harry, who was neither first nor female, getting his father's attention proved difficult. What time is Christmas? It wasn't such an exciting event, the birth of Prince Harry, as it was with William, because William was obviously the first child, and it was a huge build-up. Diana was very concerned to make both boys feel very equal, because, of course, everybody recognised that William was far more important than his younger brother. And there was a sort of general feeling that you should feel sorry for Harry, because he was always destined to be second best. Far from feeling second fiddle, by one year, Harry was a star. Diana had a strong sense that her children were on the cusp of a new age in royal history. She wasn't clear on what that should involve, but she wanted it to be different. Private royal moments like these had never before been shown so publicly. <laughs> Life at the palace seemed picture perfect. William's a typical three-year-old, because I've worked with three-year-olds, and very enthusiastic about things, pushes himself right into it. He's not at all shy and very polite, extraordinary enough. Where else, um, perhaps Harry is, is more quieter and just watches whether he copies William. We wait and see, but he's certainly a different character altogether. The public perception was always that um, Diana was the playful one, she was the caring mother, she was the touchy-feely one. But the truth is that Charles was also a very, is a, a, a caring and tactile father. <laughs> In time, Chili Charles couldn't help but warm up to the lovable lad. He was just adored his father, and they used to go out into the garden at Highgrove and look at the plants, and Charles would say to him, oh, plants have feelings too, and he formed a special little bond with Harry because perhaps he felt guilty about wishing that Harry had been a girl. He, he was just a very cute, adorable little boy, whereas William was the naughty one then. When the prince hit preschool, Diana insisted that Harry, like Wills, attend one nearby. At Mrs. Miner's, Harry continued his love affair with the press. Diana didn't want them to have the handicaps that her husband had had, which she understood. And she didn't want them to be irresponsible. Prince Charles was tutored in a 120-room schoolhouse, Buckingham Palace until he was packed off to boarding school at age eight. Grammar school for Diana's boys was here at Weatherby, a day school also close to home. Harry was the most angelic, adorable child. He was very much in William's shadow, as often a, a second child is. But Harry was 
the quieter one then. And as he matured and began to develop his own personality, uh, he became the, the bigger personality of the two. He would arrive with bravado, no worries about going to this new school, very proud of his new uniform, his little bag with his name on, and skipped up the stairs and was in, you know, no, no sort of hanging around with mum. He, he was obviously really looking forward to it. and. On lots of occasions when we saw him out and about with his classmates, he was always sort of like the little joker of the pack leading the, leading the gang along the pavement. As the boys grew older, it was clear early on that Harry was a jock. I mean, his first ski lesson, I'll never forget that. I remember him skiing through the instructor's legs within, within 25 minutes of starting, and he loved it. His face was full of joy, and he was, look, Mama, look, Mama, and, you know, she was so pleased that that he could do it. William was in tears every time he fell over. William was moaning and his policeman was trying to counsel him and say, don't worry, William, you know, but Harry was flying. It was as though this was his destiny, you know. He was not going to be a rocket scientist, but by God, he was going to be a, a good sportsman. While still a tyke, Harry hammed for the press so much he was known as the Clown Prince. It got so bad, he was renamed Harry the Horrible. Soon, folks suspected that Harry was acting out, that things maybe weren't so rosy in the royal household. Unbeknownst to Harry, by the time he was three, both Charles and Diana were having affairs. Charles with Camilla Parker Bowles, Diana with riding instructor Captain James Hewitt. Sadly, the boys' royal roots were no guarantee against a broken home. There were rows, and William and Harry heard the shouting, they heard the, the disputes, they saw their mother crying, they saw their father in a bad temper, and clearly this had a uh, profound effect on them. Where do you get your pet's flea, tick, and heart? Bye bye. This is Davy Jones, back with another fun-filled edition of M vs. M, Monkeys vs. Monarchy. Mike Nesmith's dog Frack once bit Sonny and Cher. Uh, no damage. And the Queen Mum's Corgi once bit Queen Elizabeth, requiring three stitches. The Monkeys made commercials for Rice Krispies. Sarah Ferguson makes commercials for Weight Watchers. And finally, Edward VIII is the only king of England to abdicate his throne. Mickey Dolans is the only monkey who never officially quit the group. In November 1992, Charles and Diana dropped clues to the misery inside the palace. On a trip to Korea, the depressed duo were labeled Mr. and Mrs. Glum. As the world watched the breakdown of the royal marriage in the media, Harry and William took an unwilling ringside seat. At Highgrove in particular, where Charles liked to spend most of his time, there were rows. And William and Harry heard the shouting, they heard the, the disputes, they saw their mother crying, they saw their father in a bad temper. And clearly, this had a uh, profound effect on them. Like William, Harry, I think, had to uh, put away a lot of the hurt that he felt. He couldn't come to terms, I think, with the enormity of his parents' marriage breakdown. No child wants to see that, and they are no exception. But word of the split came whether Harry could hack it or not. The Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. Their Royal Highnesses have no plans to divorce, and their constitutional positions are unaffected. In the War of the Waleses, Diana's weapon of choice was withholding the children from Charles. He would look forward to the boys coming from boarding school and spending the weekend at Highgrove. And the housekeeper would say, oh, I'm sorry, the princess has just left for London, taking the boys with her. You know, that, those sort of things would happen all the time. So he was constantly kept from his children. Charles struck back by dishing up tales of his adultery, telling Diana and the world that he'd never loved her. Not very royal, I'll say that. Finally, Queen Elizabeth snapped and ordered Charles and Diana to divorce. 
the marriage ended legally in 1996. Happily, once the divorce was a done deal, tensions between Charles and Diana eased and the royal family relaxed a little bit. I think it was easier for the boys then, you know, they knew that when they were with either parent, it was going to be peaceful. I think before the, the, the squabbling and the bitterness and the lies that were being told and all this, um, this bad, bad feeling everywhere, they realised that this has come to this and it's time to be sensible and grown up about it and, let's, and let, the, let the children, you know, enjoy their life. To Charles, enjoying life meant showing Harry the princely pursuits of shooting and uh, killing. Diana found less lethal amusements. Harry was always a little bit more adventurous than William, uh, which was a bit surprising given the age difference, but uh, Harry was really up for anything. I guess the ride favourite was Logger's Leap um, because it's a, a very exciting water ride and uh, the princess particularly enjoyed it because she would ride in the boat with the boys and myself but behind us, in the boat behind, would be the protection squad and uh, she greatly enjoyed, as indeed the boys, looking behind to see how wet they got. Diana told me that she was really frightened that she was going to lose the boys and she fought back by publicly you know being the great super mum so the more she was photographed posing as the loving mum the, the better it was so there was a little bit of manipulation and a little bit of actually just desperately wanting to do those things with her boys throughout 96 and into 97 the princes divided their time between households that spring, Diana met businessman Dodi Fayed, who invited the princess and her boys to spend part of their summer vacation at his villa in the south of France. After the emotionally draining divorce, Harry finally seemed to be getting his groove back. In August, the boys headed to Scotland for a little vacation time with Dad. In the fall, Harry was to join Wills at Eton. Harry was just a few days short of his 13th birthday and it was, I think, probably a more crucial moment in his life than for William. Charles felt that Harry wasn't yet ready to go to Eton and I think that Harry himself was very insecure about making that big move to, to, to this famous school. On the boys' last night at Balmoral, Prince Charles had Harry's future on his mind. He wrote to Diana in Paris, asking if she thought Harry should be held back a year. He mailed the letter and went to bed. We have reports from Paris that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident and that her partner, Dodi Fired, has also been killed. Charles then had to face telling the children. He had to go into William and Harry's bedrooms and say, Mum is dead. He has said that that was the most difficult thing he has ever done, and it must have been. William was stoical, and Harry just didn't want to believe what he was being told. He wanted everybody to check he thought there'd been a mistake he just didn't want to believe it harry's world was shattered four days after diana's death harry and william ventured out from seclusion to acknowledge tributes to their mother it's just it makes you shudder to think how those two boys felt when they knew that the mother had been killed because that's all I could think of, all I could think of was those two boys and the things that, you know, the first few days after she was killed, to me, it was just like flashbacks of all those minutes that I'd seen them together.
how they coped, I'll never know. How they never broke down in tears, I'll never know. But... And the people in the crowd were saying, God love you, Harry. I remember it clearly, you know, you're a great little boy, and, 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 and William was thanking people from the crowd, but Harry never said a word, you know, so it was obviously very moving to him. And they were looking at the reading the messages, and, and Harry, as he say, was only tiny, he's 12 years of age. It was two weeks before his 13th birthday. On the morning of the funeral, millions gathered on the streets of London to pay their respects to the princess and her sons. The sight of small Harry walking behind his mother's coffin was heartbreaking. Trying to keep his composure on that long walk, Harry clenched his fist so tightly it was reported his hands bled. He was the smallest in that crowd of very tall men, and yet he walked taller than any of them because he was so composed and fantastic. And there in front of him was the wreath with his handwriting with mummy written on it. It was so heartrending to see it. And um, I think we all know now that if Harry could do that on that most important day in his life, he'll always have that courage. He'll always be somebody who can draw from within the sort of um, the ability to cope in awful situations. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Ever since Alex was about this high, I have dreamt of this day. I just wanted to make sure that the day that we sent our little girl off to start her own family was every bit as memorable as the day she first joined ours. Aww. But I'm just their financial advisor. Some weeks after Diana's death, Charles figured time away might cheer up the 13-year-old heartbroken Harry. Charles wanted to take him with him, wanted to share some new experiences with him, and probably to sort of boost his morale a little bit and cheer him up. Their father-son trip may have been just what the doctor ordered. In South Africa, Harry met the Spice Girls up close and personal. Charles tried to introduce some fun things to the trip for him that made him laugh, and there was a lot of sort of father-son moments which were rather nice to see. And I think everybody felt quite reassured at that stage because everybody was worried about how the boys were doing. And to see him with his father laughing together was very reassuring that life was going on for Harry. But much as everyone wanted to believe Harry was okay, there's no denying it was a rough fall. Despite repeating a year, his grades dove, he acted up and couldn't focus. I think he's been more badly affected by his mother's death than William has. And he was forced to go back to school almost immediately afterwards. I think a fortnight after Diana died, he had to go back to school, where his school friends had been ordered not to speak about Diana's death. And I think that has affected him profoundly. But incredibly, Harry bounced back. In the spring, shocking perhaps even himself, Harry knuckled down and passed the entrance exam to Eton, Britain's most prestigious prep school. There was jubilation, actually, within the royal family. Prince of Wales, in particular, was cock a -hoop. I think Harry, too, had proved something to himself, that he was able to make the grade for a, a good school. It was convenient that Harry should go to Eton and be with William, uh, particularly after the death of Diana. There was that sort of emotional support which everybody thought was important for Harry. But even as the shock of his mother's death seemed to ease, other reactions started to surface. In the summer of 98, Harry began the pattern of good prince, bad prince he was to stick with for years. At a dam in Wales, he dangled over a 160-foot drop without a helmet or safety line, and the press gobbles it up. Harry has 
no fear. He's a fearless rider, he's a fearless skier, and, and he will do it. If you say, Harry, I dare you to jump out of the second floor, third floor window, he'll do it. Harry would jump out of an aeroplane. Harry will do anything. He won't think about it, he'll just do it. To the amazement of many, Prince Harry lived through the summer and landed safely on his feet at Eton. The day that Harry enrolled at Eton was very touching because the same things were happening as happened with William when Charles and Diana went with him. But this time, of course, it was different because Harry was on his own with his father. There was no Diana around. But judging from the smile on his face, Harry seemed happy to be here. And when he joined the same dormitory as Will's, it appeared the two had forged a new bond. But that's where the similarities ended. I don't think Harry enjoyed the academic side of it as much as his brother did. He, he enjoyed the sports. They have so many clubs there. I mean, there's about more than 40 clubs for boys to join. Eton was one big playground for Harry. He played rugby, soccer, and even tried the bizarre Eton wall game. A game so incredibly baffling, I am at a complete loss as to how to explain it to you. In fact, nobody really understands it. Welcome to the wall game. It's a sort of a cross between football, rugby, and all-out war. And it's said to have inspired Quidditch in Harry Potter. It involves two teams pushing and pulling each other along a wall, with a ball in the middle. One goal is a door, another goal is a concrete-filled tree trunk. And not surprisingly, only a couple of goals have been scored in the last 100 years. But it's a kind of risky, rough sport that Prince Harry positively relishes. As for the rules of the war game, there are a few rules. No headbutting, no kicking, no spitting, no biting. Despite all of that, scholars have been killed. Today, you're very lucky if you come away just covered in mud and glory and all your bones intact. To Charles Joy, Harry kept a low profile until the summer of 2001, when he became, once again, a noble nuisance. This was the summer he tossed his cookies on the Rattlebone Bar, got stoned in Club H, and did his drive-by visit of rehab. Two months after the media blitz over Harry's partying died down, the prince is headed to Switzerland for spring break 2002. Despite a bout with mono, Harry eclipsed his brother on the slopes, as usual. That's good, that's good, I like that. How are you feeling? Very well, thank you. If I'd heard that uh, Prince Harry has never um, experienced alcohol and one or two other things and um, never stayed out late and never chased any girls at all, I'd be very worried about him. On that score, then, Harry's daredevil, drinking, drugging, skirt-chasing ways ought to have set everyone at ease. But he also flunked two spring finals and barely scraped by on a third. Close to the fifth anniversary of his mother's death, the headlines told of Harry downing nine shots of vodka at a social gathering. Oh, yeah, that's brilliant, isn't it? Also in the summer of 2002, Diana's private secretary published a tell-all that painted the princess in a bad light. I think his drinking and binging and smoking and general rowdy behavior probably comes as a result of Diana's death at a crucial moment in his life when he was 13. And I think he will bear that burden for the rest of his life. Harry's future, I think, is going to be interesting. For every woman who has ever had painful, burning feminine itch, relief has just gotten better. Maximum Strength Vagisil with odor blocking protection. The strongest itch medicine of its kind. Vagisil relieves itch instantly, while vitamins soothe irritated skin. And now it helps block odor for real odor protection. With Vagisil, the relief lasts, even through the night. Trust Vagisil, now with odor blocking. A better understanding of better intimate care. My hair color does something yours doesn't. Because it's Garnier Nutrice, the only hair color that nourishes with grapeseed and avocado oils. Rich, radiant color, 
All because Nutrice means nourish. So hair takes color better and holds it longer, root to tip. And speaking of color, nourished hair means better color. And grays? Gone. Guaranteed. Can your hair color do all that? Garnier Nutrice. Nourished hair, better color. Garnier. Trust them. They're experts. Where do you get your pet's flea, tick, and heartworm medications? I have to get to the vet's office. <laughs> I saved a visit to my vet's office. I didn't have to leave home. I just call 1-800-PET-MEDS, and my pet's medications are delivered right to my door. 1-800-PET-MEDS guarantees the lowest price on all your pet's medications. Booster with paid order, rush delivery available. So, you want to be a princess, or at least have a title of some kind. Well, the only way to be a princess if you're not born one is to marry a prince. Now, Harry is still available. Titles are a bit easy to come by. The Queen hands out scads of them every year. Anyone can make a nomination. You can even nominate yourself on the official royal website. But don't hold your breath waiting to hear. Certain titles are also for sale. You can buy one for about $15,000. Now, if you have a bit more money, you can get the title with land. For the truly frugal, there are websites guaranteeing to make you a lord or earl or baron for as little as $300. Although, I hardly think that those would even get you into the parking lot at Windsor Castle. The summer of Harry's 17th year was spent much like that of his 16th in the headlines. But in the fall of 2002, the prince turned 18. For his birthday, Harry gave himself a whole new look, this one created in Diana's image. His weekend was spent coming of age in every sense. Visiting his mother's favorite charities, Harry seems to be seriously trying to shed his party animal skin. Harry has this more difficult job of defining what a spare should do and copying his mother, who had a similar identity problem and made a marvelous persona for herself, seems to be very shrewd and also very healing. Even though he's just a teenager, Harry's already learning how a prince can make money off his fame. Profits from these pics, taken by Diana's favorite photographer, will go to charity. didn't want them wrapped up in proverbial cotton wool. She wanted them to know what it was like to be hurt, know what it was like to have feelings, know what it was like to hurt somebody else. And she also wanted them to see that the, the, there was another side to life, that, 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 that where people weren't as lucky as they were. Harry also got his very own coat of arms for his 18th from Grandma, the Queen. He has a few more scallop shells from the Spencer side than Williams. But hey, who wouldn't want those? Nice coat of arms, Harry. Harry's trying to be good, but the media's decided it's Harry time. Days after Harry's 18th, James Hewitt, Diana's lover of six years, publicly denied a rumor that he was Harry's real father, saying Harry was a toddler when he and Diana met. Tatler Mag names Harry most dateable stud. Brother Wills, he doesn't even make the top 10. Harry's called naughty but nice, irreverent, mischievous, and terrific looking. The girls, it's reported, are absolutely berserk over him. And when a tabloid snaps his dorm room, Harry is caught with someone else's pants down. Apparently, quickly moved laundry revealed a girl's G-string. Uh, what would the queen think? I don't think we can expect a conventional prince in Harry. Harry's future, I think, is going to be interesting. Uh, he's going to be very unpredictable, uh, and I think that he will uh, perform very differently in the new generation of royals. And I think we're going to see some fireworks. Everyone wants to know what this guy's going to do, or if he can even get out of high school. It was the natural reaction of any 18-year-old. School is out, A-levels are over, summer is about to begin. Okay, so he squeaked by on gut courses. Now, what about the rest of his life? It's not like the guy doesn't have options. 
Harry's bright enough to see that there is a, a lot he can do. I mean, there's so much charity work that needs um, support from royal figures or personalities like that. And so you can't really say, well, let them go off and retire somewhere because they can have useful roles. And eventually, let's hope they'll all be able to earn their own living. Harry could make a tidy living as an artist. Turns out the prince paints big time. These works are worth close to 40 grand. But what Harry really wants is to play pro polo for a year. It's always easy to pick out Harry. He's the fastest, he's the wildest, he's the one that's nearly falling out of the saddle, you know, taking all kinds of risks to hit the ball. And he's just amazing to watch. But more than that, he's got the sort of chutzpah. He, he's daring, he, he's got the, the love of it, you know. The, he doesn't hesitate ever, he just charges straight in and uh, he's a true sportsman. Well, I think Harry turning professional, it's, it's an interesting idea. I mean, he is, he is a good player and he will go far. He would get a lot of games just on the fact that people find, you know, it's a lot of kudos having the Prince in your team. But whether that team would win a lot of games would be quite interesting to see. And you can see it. Charles tried to nix Polo, but the Prince prevailed, and now he's touring with the Young England team down under. Looks like trouble. <laughs> On a Saturday night after the Polo, the club will be, you know, lively place to be, and all their friends will be there. It's a horsey world that they understand and enjoy, and they're going to be with people who speak the same horsey language. And lots of pretty girls now attracted to polo. That's the place to go and find yourself a rich husband. Charles knew all about the polo scene. After all, that's where he met Camilla. Ooh, I love when things get catty. <coughs> as for Harry, he seems to be doing at least as well as dear old dad in the date department. I think they're drawn to Harry because of his love of fun. Of course, because he is Prince Harry is always going to be an attraction. Let's face it, I mean, that's who he is, after all. And he does have a good line in banter, you know, would you like to come back to my palace for a drink? You know, it's not everyone that can say that or offer that, is, is it? Can't say they can. But the question for Harry seems to be whether he can keep his partying nature in check long enough to focus on more serious matters. If you want to stop in its tracks a tendency toward the life of a playboy You'd better impose on the young royals a profound sense of a work ethic. Develop an interest. Go to school. We expect this of you. And you're going to get a job, and you're going to have to look after yourself. If they don't do that, he's lost. The military will help whip him into shape. When Harry's through with polo, he's off to Sandhurst, Britain's West Point. The army would provide the kind of discipline that he probably needs. Although whether after the kind of free and easy life he's had, he would be able to stomach it, I'm not sure. But I, I think that would be the safest and, and, you know, I mean, a very worthwhile thing to do. Being interested in the military and being a wild child seemed to me to go together. He likes guns, he likes having fun, he, he likes destroying things. <laughs> I think military and wild child are good. Harry was the head of the cadet corps at Eton, although he didn't win the Sword of Honour, which, which William won, which is for the best cadet. But he did lead the parade um, uh, on Founders' Day. That is a great honour to lead the parade. And um, I think his father was very proud of him. And if he does get lost, Harry always has his older brother Wills to look to. When Harry and William were growing up, there was always great rivalry. And it was more than just a sort of fraternal banter, brotherly competition. Harry had something to prove, because it meant so much to Harry to be able to keep up with his older brother. But with more than their share of misfortune, it's not surprising the two princes have grown close. Those boys have always been pretty close, and I think they will be. Uh, forever. I think that uh, they're very close together in ages and of course William being the bossy one and the elder one and eventually will be one day hopefully be our king. 
Uh, I think it works perfectly. And now that Camilla has moved in with Charles and the boys, who knows, maybe she too will help keep him on track. Clearly, Camilla was uh, a part of their father's life, and he was happy when he was with her. And I think that um, Harry, like William, has realized that. I don't think that takes anything away from the memory of their mother, but I think that um, Camilla, Charles, William, and Harry will sooner rather than later be portrayed as a family group. She's obviously slipped into the role of being part of their lives, and I think they're mature enough to sort of deal with that now, and they're probably quite happy about it. I mean, obviously, she's never going to replace their mother, and I don't think they'll ever look to her for that, but um, she's, she, you know, she's a part of their lives, whether you like it or not. And before folks go getting too serious on this guy, remember, Harry's a teenager who some say is maturing into a prince of a guy. I'd like to think that Diana hoped for her children what every good mother does, that they'd have fun as children, that they'd be permitted to make mistakes, that they'd grow and learn from those mistakes, and that they'd have good lives. I don't think she looked beyond that. Any sensible mother doesn't. Well, Diana is looking down on them. She is seeing them turn out quite well. I know she would have been, uh, she'd probably have clipped his ear uh, after some of the recent events. But I think she'd be proud as punch when she sees the way he's developed into a fine young man. So, Prince Harry, are you on your way to becoming the very model of a modern major general? Or does some other fate await? This is Davy Jones. Whatever happens, you'll hear about it here on Meet the Royals. Introducing Bio Channel at 8. Every night, you'll see stars at 8. I'm not the genius they say I am, and I'm not the idiot they say I am. Close-ups at 8. If you lose confidence in what you're doing, then it takes an awful lot to get to the end of the scene. Life is great every night on Bio Channel at 8.